All right, everybody, welcome to the first lab. This is lab zero, an introduction to the Python labs that we're gonna be using in our calculus classes. So I just wanna give you a quick rundown of how these are gonna go, how you can work on them, and give you a bit of an idea of like what the main goals are here. So I'm gonna work through some of these introductory examples with you. So feel free to pull up your copy of the lab and follow along as we do things. Uh, feel free to mess around with stuff as we're going. The first thing I want to show you is this big note up at the front, up at the top here that says, hey, you can make a copy of this lab in your Google Drive by doing this stuff. And if you don't do this, your changes won't be saved. When you submit it to me, I'm not going to see anything. So notice there's a button right here that says copy to drive. You can click on that or you can click file, save a copy in drive. Doesn't really matter which one you do. If you do this, you're going to see a little note down here. This is creating a copy. And a new window pops up, bang, copy of Lab Zero Introduction to Python Labs. I might go ahead and just change this, call it Math 151 Lab Zero, put my name in the top there, cool. I also got this little note here that says the notebook is open with private outputs. The outputs won't be saved. That's not a big deal. All that means is that when you run this code, it's going to display some stuff underneath that display will be gone when you reopen this, but all your work is still saved. So all you have to do is just click on the run buttons. I'll show you what I mean. This is what the labs look like. I'm just gonna close this little banner here. This is what the labs look like. Um, each of these little boxes, whether it's text or code, you can edit. There's a little pencil over here that says, hey, let me click the edit button, or you can just double click on it. It's all written in Markdown. So if you're familiar with that, that's what it's gonna look like. Uh, I forget when the due date is. So I'll just write someday. But you can see there's my name and the due date. And there we go. As we go through these, then, there's some introductions on how you're going to be doing things, some instructions on what we're looking at, and also some leading examples for, uh, or, or some explanation of the leading examples that we're going to be looking at. So here, we're just going to be doing some basic operations, addition, subtraction, things like that. Uh, we're going to look how to use variables, create functions, and then graph those things. You'll notice that there's no calculus on this lab. This is just used to get us familiar with what we're gonna be doing here, learn how to actually type in our labs, run some code, answer some questions, and submit the file. There's a note here that says, make sure that you run every block of code in order to see how it works and get a feel for the differences. What I mean by that is you can just click on the play button here. If you're in, in the code chunk, you can also hit control enter and it'll run things for you, but Let's just read through what we're going to be doing here. We're going to do some basic operations, 5 plus 3, 7 minus 2, et cetera, et cetera. These seem easy. We could do these in our head. We do not need a computer program to do this, but let's just do this. We'll click the run thing here. The first time you do it, it's going to say, oh, we're not specifying the runtime. It's going to default to Python 3. That's good. That's fine. We don't care about that. I like using Python 3 here because it does some specific things, and I don't really know a ton of the differences, to be honest. I'm not a computer scientist. Um, what you'll notice, though, is that we've actually only shown one answer, right? This is five-thirds. This is the last one. So we don't have these first three. Okay, so to display things in Python, what we're going to have to do is wrap it up in a print command here. So we're going to say, let's print 5 plus 3 and 7 minus 2 and 3 times 3 minus 8 and five-thirds. And now when we do that, here are all of our answers. 5 plus 3 is 8. 7 minus 2 is 5. 3 times 3 minus 8 is 1. And there's our five thirds, 1.6666667. Cool. There's a little note here about division. This is all mainly based on using Python 2 versus Python 3. The moral of the story is that this division bar means exactly what you think it means here. That's good. Let's learn how to do exponents. We're going to use double asterisks for exponents. So if we want 3 raised to the 5th, we're going to use 3 star star 5. For the square root of 4, we can write that as 4 to the half. And so we'll write that as 4 star star half. We'll print both of these things, and there we go. There's 3 to the 5th. There's the square root of 4. Neat. You can also use square roots by using a square root function, but that function has to come from a different package. Um, there's only so many things that are included in base Python that Python knows how to do by itself. And if you want anything more than that, what we have to do is load in one of these external packages. We're gonna do two of these constantly, all semester long. So we're gonna get really comfortable with loading in NumPy or NumPy as NP, and anytime we wanna use a function from NumPy, 
we'll have to prefix it with np. So we're telling Python, by the way, this square root function is from numpy. That's where you're going to be looking for it. So this is the square root of 4. This is log of 7. Really, it's the natural log. This log function in numpy is by default natural log. And now we've got e raised to the log of 7. Well, that should just be 7, right? Because e and the log cancel each other out. This is sine of pi over 4. And notice that we have to use np sine and np pi. np square root 2 over 2. Notice that that is what sine of pi over 4 is. So those two last two things should be the same. And if we run this, you'll notice maybe one weird thing. I had said, oh, on this third one, this is e raised to the log 7. Those things cancel each other out. That's technically not 7, right? That's 6.9999999999 or whatever. Uh, that's a little weird. That's mostly just some like algorithmic errors uh, that get in here. And so there's some precision errors that can sometimes happen in weird spots. Not a big deal. It's just something that we'll keep an eye on. I will help you through any sort of weird issues like that. All right, moving on to some more fun stuff. How do we use variables here? So in this case, you can kind of scroll down and see what we're doing. We've got these dimensions of a box. It's two by five by four. And we want to find volume and surface area and things like that. So what I'm going to do is just set the length, or L, equal to 2, the width equal to 5, and the height equal to 4. And from there, I can just set up a volume function, or not really a function, but I can say volume is equal to length times width times height. And then I'll just print out what the volume is. And the surface area is 2 times the length times the width, plus 2 times the width times the height, plus 2 times the length times the height. It's the area of all the sides of your boxes. And we'll just print out the area. And if we want, we can use volume and area for things. We can say, let's print out the volume divided by the area for whatever reason. And here we go. Neat. Uh, the cool thing about this is that now if we want to do all this same stuff, but just for a different box, that's maybe 4 by 1 by 7. All I have to do is change these values. And since I'm defining volume and surface area and everything else based on my values of length, width, and height, I just have to run this with those new change values. That's going to be really helpful for us when we try things with different inputs and different values. You can just set up your code so that we, we call it reproducibility. So you can just kind of change this, copy and paste stuff, and it works out nicely. So feel free to take advantage of that kind of thing. Now we want to set up some functions. Maybe what I'm going to do is just write this in for you just so we can see what's going on. We've got three functions here. Um, I'm going to say uh, def is our, our short form for define. We're going to define this function. We're going to define f. We have to tell it what the input is going to be. We'll call it x here. It doesn't have to be that. Then we're going to use a colon. And if you hit enter, it's going to automatically indent things. We have to tell Python what to return from our function. And we're going to return x squared minus 1. So this is x squared, my double asterisk for my exponent, minus 1. Great. And now I'll go define g of theta, return, what is this, uh, theta times cosine theta. What you'll notice is that we're indented here. And I want to show you what that's going to do for us in just a second. We have one more function, I think. Um, oh, no, the area function is already defined, so we're good to go. Um, Oh, wait, no, it's not defined. We just have it here. Let me just copy and paste this. There's my surface area formula. Now I'll define it as a function. Area L, W, and H are my three different inputs. So notice now we can have like multiple inputs for things. And here's my function that I'm just going to copy and paste from here. If I run this, first off, what we'll notice is that nothing happened. And that's okay, because all this little chunk of code is telling Python to do is store these three functions in its memory so that when we want to access them, we just have to talk about f and g and area and things like that. If I run this, what you're going to notice is that we've got an error. And it's kind of helpful because it's pointing right to the spot that it comes up with the error. And it's saying, hey, g is not defined. And we can scroll up and say, oh, wait a second, we did define it. But you'll notice that there's this extra indent here. This is kind of strange. Indents are really powerful and important in Python. What this is doing is it thinks that all of this is a part of this f function. So it does not have g or area defined in its memory. So what I'm going to do is just use shift tab to bring this over one. And now when I run this, we should be good to go. Hey, look, we've printed out f of 0, f of 4, 
there's g of pi and g of pi over 6 and our area for a 254 box. Neat. Um, if we want to print out a whole bunch of different evaluations, like let's say we wanted to run this g function for a bunch of angles, it might be kind of annoying to type out g of pi, g of pi over 6, g of pi over 2, g of pi over 7, whatever. So what we'll do instead is we'll just write them all in a list. We can use these square brackets to build a list. We're not going to use this a lot. We will use lists, but we're not going to build them manually like this that much. But let me just show you how this works. This is a list of angles. I can print them out if you'd like to see them. It's just going to display 0, pi over 6, etc., etc., etc. And underneath that are all the G outputs of those. So this is our function outputs of all of these five different angles. What we're going to do is we're going to set up these lists a little bit more systematically. So we're going to go ahead and play with this NPA range function. The NPA range function takes in a starting spot, a stopping spot, and a step size. So this is saying let's count from negative 4 up to 0 by 0.5s. Neat. We'll go ahead and we'll do this. We'll print out the x values. We'll print out the y values, the, the f of x values. And you might notice that like, hey, wait a second. There's something kind of strange going on with these x values. Because we told it to count from negative 4 up to 0 by 0.5, but it didn't actually get there, right? It stopped at negative 0.5. The NPA range function and the range function in Python and a couple other things like that, um, they don't include the ending point. So we, we're actually telling it to count from negative 4 up to but not including 0. You can think of it like an open interval here. Uh, and so what we need to do then is actually tell it to shoot a little bit past there. So here I'll just say like, okay, count from negative 4 up to 0.5 but not including 0.5 by 0.5s. And now you can notice, all right, we captured 0 in there. I could also have included like 0.2 as the stopping point here as long as it's past 0, right? So that's why I'm saying it's got to be in this little interval between 0 and 0.5 for our stopping spot. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. That's fine. And now you'll notice we've got all of the actual x values that we want, and there are the y values. Everything is great. That leads us pretty easily into graphing things. Let's say we want to graph some functions. We're going to use the matplot library, um, which is prefixed with PLT here. I'll include this little chunk of code for you every time so you can run these libraries. We'll get pretty familiar with it. And this is a pretty easy one in terms of its syntax. We're going to use plot, prefixed by PLT, and we just have to give it a list of x values and a list of y values. These x values were defined earlier, and f was defined earlier, so we're just going to say, okay, the y values are just the function outputs here, and I'll plot this. And if you look at this graph long enough, you might see some strange features here. Notice that there's kind of some sharp corners here. That's because what we're literally doing is just plotting the points that we've defined, these points that we found up here, and then we're just connecting the points with a, a straight line. This is like the way that you probably learned to graph things way back the very first time you graphed something. But now we know a lot more about parabolas. We know that there shouldn't be a straight line connecting these. It should be nice and smooth and curved. So what we should do is just change our list of x values to include a whole bunch of points that are really close to each other. That way we just don't notice the straight lines in between them. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to set up a new x interval, NPA range. I'm going to count from negative 4 up to 0 0.001, but not including 0 0.001. And I'm going to count by 0 0.001s. And I'll run this thing, and this is a much nicer plot. It's good and smooth like a parabola is expected to be. What you'll notice is that we don't even have to actually count past zero here. I can just say, sure, count from negative 4 up to but not including zero. This is counting up to negative 0 0.001, right? Um, and if we run this, we have a new picture of a graph that isn't very different because we're never going to be able to notice that that point's not there. So that's fine. No big deal. Um, this is an alternative syntax that you can use. Instead of the arrange function, you can use linspace, which is the same kind of thing, except uh, what you do instead is, instead of defining a step size, we define the number of points you want to include. So instead of saying count by point zero zero ones, we could say just throw 4,000 points in between there. And you'll notice it's the exact same thing. We've got 4,000 points plotted in here with technically straight lines connecting them, but we never notice. There's so many points that it's hard to tell. 
We can do the same kind of thing, but with multiple graphs. So notice that this is x to the one third. That's the cube root function. And then we have e to the negative x. I'm going to use this lin space thing as well. We're going to go from 0 up to 10. And look at that. We've got two curves on here. They're colored nicely. Everything works great. OK, so what else do you need to do on this lab? Well, here is where it's your turn. Uh, this is where you're always going to be starting your labs. I'm going to label the start point of it always your turn. You can run this thing here. You'll notice that if you ever get an error that says something like NP not defined or plot not defined, it just means you have to rerun this. No big deal. And now you've got a bunch of empty code chunks where you can type in your own code. You can say, all right, what is 14, oops, there we go, 14 squared minus 10. And you can run this thing. And you'll notice that if you then move on to another one, hey, maybe we need to include the print statements in here and things like that. So go ahead and build all the stuff you're supposed to build here. What you'll notice is that after each section, you're going to have some follow-up questions. These questions are just going to ask you sometimes what you think Sometimes it's going to ask you to think critically about what you're doing and explain something. Sometimes it'll actually ask you to do some calculus on the side and confirm answers or make a comparison. To answer these questions, you can just open this up by either double clicking on it or clicking on the pencil here. And underneath here, you can type, here is my answer. And if you could type it correctly, that would be nice. And then look, there it is. It shows up underneath. Everything works great. Uh, the stars are the things that are using the italics. There's a little format thing here that you can use if you want to include different things. Uh, and then once you're finished with that, you can just kind of click out of there and, hey, look, there's your answer saved. That way I'll be able to read it and grade it pretty easily. When you're finished with the lab, make sure that it's saving things all the time. All changes saved. That's good. Make sure that it's still in your Google Drive. Everything's good there. When you're finished, you'll just share this with me. There's a big share button up here that you can click. What I would like for you to do is to just change some settings. I want you to go down here and I want you to change this from restricted to anyone with this link. And then what I'd like for you to do is change it from viewer to editor. That way, when you copy this link and you paste that on Canvas in the submission box, I'll be able to click on it and I'll be able to immediately start tinkering with your code if I need to to see what's going on or what the problems are. I'll be able to change things if I need to, but also I'll be able to access the revision history, leave comments, all that kind of thing. So hopefully that's understandable what we're doing here. Hopefully this is helpful. I'm going to try and make one of these videos for each of our labs just so that you can get a feel for what the main goals are, what we're trying to do, and how this is going to connect to the course concepts. So see if you can play with this a little bit. I'm available to help out with anything that you need here. I'm happy to help you out with the code. The point of these labs is for you to start understanding calculus in through a different perspective. This lab specifically doesn't have any calculus on it. This is just to get our feet wet with the code so that when we start doing calculus, we're not getting a whole bunch of hard math and hard coding thrown at us all at once. So hopefully after this, you'll feel a little bit more comfortable with the labs. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Pop them on the Discord, and I will help out as much as I can. All right, good luck, everybody. Let me know anything that you need.